So uh, your homework's no, no. Your homework's supposed to be up here. So the the rule's going to be I'm going to have the greater serial to like 105, and if you don't turn in by 105 each time, there'll, there'll be no credit. It's just too hard to manage, um, you know, 100 students when like 10 or 15 have some different excuse and they're sending emails back and forth, you know. I've already ac accumulated over 500 emails, something for this class. So, so let's just follow the, the rules, do the homework, come to class on time, turn in, everything will be fine. I have the first homework, which you cannot get now, but you can get after class. So don't leave after class, because um, they'll, they'll be here and you can pick them up then. All right? Okay. So... There is another homework. <laughs> I don't want you guys to get bored. So there's another homework posted up there. Um, it'll look a lot like this homework. Now all problems, I think in the future, will be problems that I'll give you that I've created myself, and I think they're better than the problems in the book, but that's just my own opinion. The book's not a chemical engineering text, so sometimes the problems have to do with weird stuff you don't care about, like screws and things like that, right? So um, I think the problems you get from now on that I've created in the past will be... Um, and they'll also be very consistent with what the problems look like on the test, okay? So if you can do the problems on the homework, those should be f pretty familiar looking in the sense that they'll look just like the ones on the test, okay? All right, and the test is coming. It's a couple weeks probably or something like that. There'll be a test. So anyway, we'll worry about that later. Um, so what was I going to say in lieu of that? I guess that's it, okay? So a typical week, we'll have class Tuesday, Thursday, we'll have a lecture. Tomorrow we'll do MATLAB. So I'll start teaching you next time how to do statistics in MATLAB so you can avoid all the onerous um, calculations that um, <laughs> you, you may currently be doing by hand, I'm not sure. Okay, so take them away. So I'm gonna, today I'm going to talk about something called hypothesis testing. And so the idea behind hypothesis testing... <laughs> <laughs> I suggest you run because they, they will chase you. Okay. This is the same thing I do after a test, by the way. I say the test is over and then I take the test and walk away. So it's not uncommon someone's chasing me across part of the campus or something trying to give me their <laughs> test. So. And I've got pretty good quickness. Speed is eh, you know, not bad. But um, I'm very, I can duck into doorways and stuff pretty, pretty readily. All right, so we'll talk about hypothesis testing. So this is a little bit different than what we talked about last time. So last time we, we calculated th uh, confidence intervals, right? So for example, we'd have a mean, we'd calculate the confidence interval on that mean, like we're 95% sure the true mean lives in this interval, right? And that would, should have been something you had some experience doing on the homework, I think. So now we're doing something a little bit different because we're really interested in decision making. So you can think of confidence uh, interval as kind of a characterization of you know, how confident you are. It doesn't really explicitly answer the question, should I, should I do something, okay? So hypothesis testing is about um, posing a hypothesis, like if you want to buy something and testing the hypothesis and deciding, you know, are you gonna, I'm going to purchase this or not. So it's a little bit different than a confidence interval, okay? I'm going to start by going through a, an example that's just like the example in the book, except I changed the problem. But the numbers are all the same. I, I don't know, I forget what they do. We do thin films, they do something else, but the numbers are the same. Um, and then I'll talk about the different distributions we're going to use to do hypothesis testing. So basically we're going to pose, and I'll tell you in a minute what I mean by hypothesis test. We're going to pose... Is that better? <coughs> better for me at least. So, okay, I'll start by defining what a hypothesis test is. Then about three or four slides I'm going to go through an example of how you do one of these hypothesis tests. I'm going to talk about the distributions, which are the t-distribution and the chi-squared distribution to do these hypothesis tests. Uh, I'm going to talk about things called alternatives. So when, we when you propose a hypothesis, you propose something called alternative to the hypothesis, and there's different alternatives you can propose. Then I'll th talk about something called testing errors. Testing errors means what's the chance the hypothesis tr is true, but you'll reject it, or you'll accept it, but it's actually not true. Okay, those are called testing errors. Um, and then finally, I'll go through how you do tests on the, on the mean and the variance, and I'll give an example for each of these two as well. Okay, so there'll be one example up there and a couple of examples down here. All right, I like to stand over here. I was thinking, just to be fair, I should stand over here occasionally. You guys are kind of lonely, right? This guy's like, come on over. All right. This is, well, wait a minute. 
This is actually quite a bit further away. See, that's why I don't come over here. I'm not even sure my pointer has the power. Okay, I'm not even sure I can read it, actually. All right, so I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna be over here for long, but I will be here now. All right, so here's the idea behind uh, hypothesis testing, okay? We want to know if a particular hypothesis is true, and we're gonna do a statistical analysis of the data we have available to test the validity of our hypothesis. As usual, this has to be in a statistical sense, you know? We can't be 100% sure, you know, maybe 90% sure, 95% sure. And then based on the result of this hypothesis test, we'll make some decision, like we're gonna buy this stuff or not buy this stuff or sell it or not sell it or what have you. This is the general procedure. The devil's in the details, as they say, but here's how we generally do it. First of all, you have to formulate a hypothesis, okay? Obviously, that's problem specific. I'll give you three examples of how to do that. You formulate an alternative hypothesis. So one uh, hypothesis might be that I think the mean of these thin films equals some value, okay? That's how your hypothesis. Your alternative hypothesis is, you know, typically this is what you want and this is what you're afraid of, okay? So the alternative might be, I actually think the thin films are too thin, okay? So that'd be an alternative in that case. So you, you specify significance levels. So this is the probability that you reject a true hypothesis, okay? So a standard value here might be 5%. You'll accept the fact that the hypothesis might be true, but you, will, you could reject it. 5% probability, let's say, of that occurring. If you want a 0% probability of rejecting a true hypothesis, you can't do anything. Because you can't be 100% sure of anything in statistics, right? So you formulate, you choose some significance level, a common one is 5% or 10%, and this will be the probability that you reject a true hypothesis. You just have to live with that, okay? Then you perform a statistical analysis on your data to test the validity of the hypothesis, and then based on this analysis, you either accept or reject the hypothesis and proceed, proceed accordingly with your decision making, okay? So that, that's the basic idea. So let's go through an example. I've already grown weary of looking from this far. So maybe I'll go over here. Okay, so let's say you've got this problem. So you want to buy some uh, solar cells. They're thin films, okay? And you have been told by the manufacturer of these films that the, the thickness of these films is 200 microns, okay? But you know, you know, you can't manufacture these thin films perfectly. And so you're wondering if this is actually true because this is what you want because you want certain properties you think require it to be about 200 microns, okay? So you formulate something called the hypothesis. Strictly speaking, this is called the null hypothesis, okay? This is that the film thickness equals that value, okay? So we say our hypothesis is the mean is equal to 200 microns. We also call that value mu naught, okay? So mu naught is the hypothesized value of the mean. This is what you want to be true because if this is true, then you like the, the, the films. What you're afraid of is they might be thinner, okay? So the alternative hypothesis, which we typically just call the alternative, and the null hypothesis, we just call the hypothesis, is that the thickness is actually less than you've been told, okay? So this is what you hope for, this is what you fear, if you will, okay? Because if the thin films are thinner than that, you don't want them, okay? So you're going to accept this hypothesis if it's satisfied up to a probability alpha. I just told you what alpha is, right? That's the probability, yeah? Uh, what, if, what about the case where the films are too thick? That's another alternative we could talk about, but that's not this example. Yeah. So his point is, you're probably concerned if it's too thin or too thick. That's called a two-sided alternative, and I'll talk about that, but not for this problem, okay? So let's just pretend we're just worried if they're too thin. All right, so remember alpha is the probability that you'll always get them switched because there's one called beta. So there's one called alpha, that's the main one. That's the probability you reject a true hypothesis. Then there's going to be another testing error called beta. That's going to be the probability you accept a false hypothesis. So I always have to get them, get them mixed up. But this one is the probability you reject a true hypothesis. You specify what this is going to be, okay? Obviously, you don't want this number large. Right? You don't want a 90% chance that you'll, you'll reject a true hypothesis. That would be stupid. <laughs> right? So you'll accept something like 5 or 10%, let's say. That's called the significance level. Okay? So if this hypothesis is true, then you'll buy the solar cells. If you find that this is not true, okay, that you can't accept this hypothesis, then you're, then you're going to reject the hypothesis, and then you're not going to buy these. Okay? 
And the idea is that you need to make this decision with a small number of samples. I think for my example, this number of samples is not that small. I think it's 20, 25, so it's a quarter of them. That's kind of a lot for most problems. But in other words, you can't make your decision by measuring the thickness of all 100, okay? Or if you're going to buy 1,000 or 10,000 of something, you might need to make your decision with measurement of 50 of them or 100 or 20 or whatever, whatever number it is. So you need to make the decision with a small number of samples, okay? All right. So this is what you've been told, or this is what you did yourself, that you took 25 of these cells randomly. Okay? You measured the thickness of these guys, and the average thickness was 197 microns. And the standard deviation, sorry, this is the variance, was 6 microns. So clearly, the, the, the average is not exactly <laughs> 200. Okay? So the question you're asking yourself, you can see it's different. But the question is, you want to know if it's kind of statistically different than desired value. So you've got this mean, it's this. It is not identically equal to what you want it to be, but is it different in a statistical sense? That's what we're trying to test, okay? All right, so this is the key idea here. Um, so we're going to calculate this, or we're going to use this thing called the T distribution, which we've used that already, right, I think, last time for confidence intervals, right? All right, so this is, the, this is the kind of the basic underlying key idea. So if the thicknesses are normally distributed, okay, meaning they follow a normal distribution, so this is a test that assumes underlying distribution is normal, then this quantity here will follow a T distribution, okay, with this number of degrees of freedom. So mu, again, is the true mean. Sorry, that's the, that's the hypothesized mean. N is the number of samples. And this are the true value and of, the, of the standard deviation and of the mean. And obviously, when we do this here, we get an observed value, right? You sample. So this is the, this is the underlying distribution, right? As if you know the true mean and the true standard deviation, you typically don't. You have to do this with uh, observed or sample mean and sample standard deviation. But the key idea here is that if these measurements are normally distributed and you compute this quantity using the samples, as I'm about to show you, then that should follow a T distribution. Okay? All right, so for this particular problem, we're going to choose a significance level of 5%, meaning we'll, we'll accept a 5% probability the hypothesis is actually true, but we might, we're going to reject it anyway. Okay? All right, so what we need to do is find this. Here, here's the key picture here. So this is the T distribution. So here's what you're interested in. So here's the normal distribution, right? That's where these samples are being taken from, okay? So the idea here is that you're going to be looking for this critical value of C here, okay? So this is like F of Z and Z for the, for the normal distribution. And so this over here will be 95% of the area, and this will be 5% of the area. We look at the tail over here because we're worried about the thin films being too thin. If we're worried about them being too thick, we'd be looking over here. And if we're looking at both ends, which I'll show you in a few minutes, we'd look at both ends, okay? So over here, if, if the value lies in here, as I'll show you, um, we're going to accept the hypothesis, which is strictly so you don't reject it. That's not quite the same as accepting it. It's just not rejecting it. But over here, you reject the hypothesis. So uh, I'll come back to this figure in just a second. Okay, so what we need to do is find the probability that the T statistic will have a probability of less than 5%. Why? Because 5% is the alpha value we chose, the significance level. And that corresponds to this 5% tail over here. And we're looking for that value C right there. Okay. So C is already listed here, but really you have to get it out of the table. And the idea here is you find it like this, okay? So this is the probability. Um, okay, so if you go to the table, you, so what do we have? We have a table. If you look at the table, you'll see values of the T distribution for different values of, so, ah, I have to write something. Let me turn this on temporarily. So we're using the T distribution. In the table, I think it's A9, is values of the T distribution. Values of the cumulative T distribution, okay? It gives you the value of 
if you know the value of F and you know the number of degrees of freedom, which for this case is the number of samples minus one, then you can get the value of Z out of the table. Okay? This critical value of Z is called C. Okay? So we're looking to find this value C and get it out of the table. Okay? The problem is that you won't find something in the table where F equals 0.05. Because I think it starts at 0.5 and goes up. Okay? So you won't even find that value. So what you do instead is find the probability that the t-statistic is, you find some critical value called c tilde. That would be, the, that would be 1 minus alpha. Okay? So bear with me a second. So we look for this first. 1 minus alpha, that's 0.95. You calculate, there's 25 degrees of freedom, right? Because you have 25 samples minus 1 is 24. And in the table, you'll find an entry for 0.95 for the probability here, okay, the cumulative probability. And for 24 degrees of freedom, you'll find that value C equals this number here. You have to look at the table to find it, okay? And the critical idea here is that the value you actually want is minus that value. So in other words, you can't find the value you want because it's not in the table. But you can find the value for 1 minus alpha, and then your value is going to be minus that because of symmetry of the distribution, okay? So you find this C tilde value in the table, and the C that you're interested in is minus that value, which is uh, point. Uh, 171. Okay? So again, for this to make any sense, you have to go in the table after the lecture or look in the book now if you have it, which no one carries a book that big around, or look electronically. But go back after the class and look and see how I obtain that value right there. Okay? All right, so now we found this critical value of C. So you understand that when you calculate this T value here from the samples, what I'm telling you is there's a 95% chance that T value is going to be in here, and there's only a 5% chance it's going to be over there. Okay? And that C value we just found divides the region where we're going to either accept the hypothesis or not reject it, or reject it. Okay? So that's what's said in words here. If the hypothesis is true, okay, there's only a 5% chance the observed value of T, which I should tell you, so here's how we calculate the observed value of t. We use this here. I'm flipping around, sorry. And w obviously, we don't know the true mean and the true standard deviation, so as usual, we use our samples here. So we calculate this t statistic here. Okay? So what is it? It's the observed value of the mean, which is, I told you, is 197, minus our hypothesized mean, which is 200, divide by a standard deviation that we obtained from the samples, which I told you was 6, divide by the square root of the number of samples, which is 25. And that's minus 2.5. So this is the observed value, okay? Or the T statistic, however you want to call it. All right? So the idea here is that if our hypothesis is true, there's only a 5% chance that this value that we compute is going to be in that region. And that's, a, that's we're willing to accept that um, we might be wrong, but only to up to a 5% probability. So the idea is if that calculated T statistic or T value is over here, we're going to reject the hypothesis. If it's over there, we're going to accept it. Yeah? Wasn't S squared equal to 6, not S? If so, I made a typo. Yeah, sorry. It's not the first time. So is that S equals 6 or the other one the square root of 6? Well, let's see. I've got to be consistent, that's all. So if this is S and this is 6, I need this to be 6 more than I need S squared to be 6. So, um, yeah. So I want this to be, I want this to be S here, not, not the... Um, this is not the variance, it's the standard deviation. Let's just make sure that doesn't propagate through anywhere else. No. Okay. Yeah. So sorry, make that S, I'll correct it. I remember the one I did last Thursday, I think I had a lot of mu knots, mu's instead of X bars. I corrected that and reposted it. So I'll try to remember to do the same here. All right. So you, you kind of get the getting the idea here that if the hypothesis is true and you compute the observed value of t, there's only a 5% chance it's going to be there or below. Okay? And that's, that's, a, that's a chance we're willing to take, <laughs> okay? because we've got to take some chance. So if we compute the observed value and it's over here, we're going to reject it. If it's over here, we'll accept. Okay? And so really, most of the work comes in getting this value, because it's not hard to compute this, obviously. So if you compute this, that's minus 2.5. Okay? Minus 2.5 is below minus 0.171. So then you're in this region where you reject, reject the hypothesis. So that means we don't, we reject the hypothesis that the true mean is equal to this. See, we don't know the true mean. 
but we think based on the samples, we don't believe this anymore. Okay? So we actually accept the hypothesis that it looks like the mean is actually less than 200, okay? and therefore we're not going to buy these things. Okay? Usually this is something the, the manufacturer does. Okay? So if you're going to manufacture these things, you'll usually have a testing plan. So you'll agree ahead of time, this is what I want you to make, and this is how I want you to test that they're good. And so the idea is if they ship these solar cells to you, they've done a test like this and it passed. If it doesn't pass, they make some more and ship you good ones. They never tell you the other ones failed, right? Because that would erode your confidence <laughs> in them. But there is an agreement when you make polymers or, or thin films or things like this that, that someone's done this kind of testing. Okay? So that's kind of the underlying... And it goes through all the different elements, right? We, we posed, sorry, posed the hypothesis here, okay, on the mean, posed an alternative, which is we're worried about it being too low. That's going to be called a left-hand test. We specified a certain significance level, and we accepted the fact that we might have a hypothesis that's true, but we'll reject it to some level, which we call alpha. Um, given this value, so we were just given these values if we, because it makes it a lot easier. Obviously, I could give you the thickness for 25 different cells and you could calculate the mean and standard deviation yourself, but I just gave it to you. And so the key thing is getting this C value, this critical value by which you divide the region into the reject region and the accept region, if you will. Calculate your T statistic, compare the two, and make a decision. Okay? So that's, that's how they all kind of work. All right, so in order to get a feeling for this, um, I did the following. I varied some of these different values, okay, to try to, sh so you could get a feeling for how this hypothesis testing works, okay. So this was the, val this is the case we just did, right? The mean was 197, the, see, I got it right here. Uh, the standard deviation was 6, we had 25 samples, the alpha was 5%. Degrees of freedom was 24. That was the C value. That was the T value. We rejected the hypothesis. So the first line is just the example. Okay. Then I went through because I guess I got too much free time, and I redid this example four more times for different cases. Okay. The first case was, and this is to improve your intuition. It helped me at least about when, how this hypothesis testing works. So what, what is the, why did we reject this hypothesis? Well, in, in, in simple terms, because the mean is too far away from the, uh, the assumed value, right? So I, I assume my hypothesis of my hypothesis test, if you will, was that if I make the mean closer to the value, the assumed value of 200, that it would probably pass. You know, I didn't know how close I had to get, so I just tried 198. So I did the whole, I did the thing over, and the only difference here is I assumed that the mean of the samples was 198 instead of 197. Now if you go through this, nothing changes except that calculated value of t, right? Because that calculated value of t depends on the mean right there. You see it's going to be, it's going to be uh, greater, right? It's not going to be as negative because those two, the numerator's smaller. It actually ends up being that, and in that case you'd accept it, okay? So obviously the mean getting closer to the hypothesis, hypothesized value is going to increase the chance you accept the hypothesis. Another thing that will make it more likely you accept the hypothesis is a higher standard deviation, right? Because a higher standard deviation means you have less confidence in this value of the mean. So if the standard deviation grows, it's going to be more likely you're going to accept the hypothesis as well. You can see that right here, right? So if S gets larger, then T is going to get smaller and it's going to move to the left of the critical C value, and you can see that here. Uh, nothing changed here except the T value, and now it's, again, not as negative. It's greater than that. You'd accept the hypothesis now. All right, what did I do for this case? Um, I, increased, I decreased the number of sa samples. Now, this seem, may seem a little perverse, right? So what I did is I decreased the number of samples. That changed the, that changed the degrees of freedom and therefore changed the C value. Right, because the C value depends on the degrees of freedom, which depends on the samples, end up being this. It also ended up changing the T value, because you take the square root of N there. So it changed both things. And now you can see, well, this number is greater than that number, now I accept the hypothesis. So this would imply, if you want to accept the hypothesis, just don't take a lot of samples. Right? <laughs> so that's not, it's not quite that simple, okay? Because there's this other testing error 
that I'm not, I haven't talked about yet called beta. That's the, that's the probability the hypothesis will be false, but you'll accept it anyway. Okay? So the idea is if you leave alpha the same and decrease the number of samples, what happens that beta gets large. So now the chance of accepting a false hypothesis is grown to a much higher level than it was before. I'll, I'll tell you later, I don't actually do it, but given um, a value alpha here, and given, yeah, given a value n and a value alpha, you can calculate this thing called beta. It's the probability that the hypothesis is false, but you accept it anyway. Okay. And if you have a small number of samples and leave alpha the same, this may look glorious, but now you've significantly increased your chance of accepting a false hypothesis. You, you see what I'm saying? You don't specify beta directly. Beta is a result of what you specify alpha to be in the number of samples. But I'm just telling you, that's, this, is, this is a little bit of fool's gold here. Okay? And we'll come back to this. All right, so the last thing was now... I'm going to reduce the alpha value, which is the probability that I'll reject a, a false hypothesis. Sorry. <laughs> is the probability I will reject a true hypothesis. I'm going to make that value smaller. And what does that change? That should change just the C value. Okay. So what that does is it moves this C value this way. Okay. It makes it smaller. And as a result of that, the, the calculated T value doesn't change, but now it fall, it's, ends up falling in the left-hand part over here. So now, it's, now it ends up passing. Okay. Okay. So what I'm going to do now is go over some of the distributions that we use to, to do this, which I think you've already seen some of these tests before or these distributions. So, um, so let's say you have the following. You have uh, independent random variables called x1, x2, up to xn. Each have the same mean and each have the same variance. Okay. So these are, remember, when we, when we use capital letters, we mean the real random variable. And we lose, with lowercase letters, we usually mean that obtained from samples. Okay. So we have n independent variables. They're normal. Okay. So independent means they have nothing to do with each other. Like they're all independent of each other. One does not depend on the other. Random means they're random variables in a statistical sense. And normal means they're normally distributed. Right? They follow a normal distribution. They each have the same mean. They have the same variance, let's say. Okay. Then, if, then this is true. If you calculate this, right? This is, this is the mean. That would be the true mean, actually, right? Take it. Divide by the number of samples, sum up, you get some value x bar. And then you can calculate this variance here the same way. Well, not the same way, but the usual way. Take the value, subtract off the mean, square it, sum them up, divide by n minus 1. And then you calculate. So the idea is we have these random variables. We calculate the mean. We calculate the variance. And then we compute this t variable. Okay, this is another random variable. Okay. And it's computed by taking this mean, subtracting off the true mean, and dividing by s. Well, the, you basically, we just used this concept before. But anyway, OK. So you calculate t. And I already mentioned this before in the lead up to this in the example. This random variable t here will follow a t distribution with this number of degrees of freedom. OK? And this, I say this because this is the distribution we're going to use um, in order to calculate, uh, hypo in order to perform hypothesis tests on the mean, which I just showed you already. Okay, so I already showed you that we're going to do this. This gives some justification for doing so. The t distribution is in table A9. I'm sure you've seen it there. Okay, so you get values of z because you're right. You're again, you can't see it up there, but f of z. So you can find values of z given f of z. So in other words, to use the table, you know what f of z is, you know the number of degrees of freedom, and then you're trying to find the value z corresponding to those. The critical value of z we call c that you look up in the table. So it just means the value of z you pull out for a particular um, value of the distribution function and the number of degrees of freedom. So the example I just gave you, right, we had 24 degrees of freedom because n minus 1. And we actually wanted to find when this thing equals 0 0.5, but I told you that's not actually in the table. So we found when this thing equaled 0.95 instead, 
and got a number. I called it C tilde, and then we found, and then because of symmetry of the distribution, we know that C equals minus C tilde. That's this whole thing back here. Okay. Okay. So if you learn nothing else from this slide, it says if you want to calculate a hypothesis test on the mean, use the T distribution. Okay. And in particular, you're going to want to compute this T statistic, which I already showed you. Okay. Um, you can do, although we haven't done this yet, we will in a moment. <coughs> a minute. You can do the same kind of hypothesis testing on the variance. And to do that, this slide addresses, we use a different distribution, which is called the chi-square distribution. We haven't talked about that yet, ha or have we? No? We didn't use that when we did confidence intervals on the variance? Yeah, we did, right? Okay. And last time I gave you the actual functional forms of these distributions, but we don't actually use the functional forms because we just take them out of the table. But okay, so again, same thing here. You got some random variables. They're independent. They're normal. Um, they each have the same mean and variance. Now we calculate this quantity. So first of all, well, we calculate x bar, then calculate s squared using the x bar, and then calculate this quantity. Take number of samples n minus 1, multiply it by s squared, divide by the true variance. This is a theoretical concept, right? It's just justifying why we use the chi-squared distribution. Um, then this variable y here will be a random variable, and this thing will follow the chi-squared distribution with this number of degrees of freedom, n minus 1, as before. Okay? The degrees of freedom is always 1 minus the number of samples. The 1 comes from the fact that you're using the thing to calculate the mean and the variance number of samples, so you lose a degree of freedom. Okay, so how do you use this? Well, it's the same kind of thing as I'm about to show you. You decide what you need to, using the test, you'll want to find a particular value of z here for the chi-squared distribution. So you know what this value f is, you know the number of degrees of freedom, and then you're going to pull out of the table the value of z. And I'll show you how to do it in a minute for an example. Okay? All right. So this is um, one of the questions that came up about, um, you know, what we should be concerned about. And so these are the so-called three possibilities for the alternative. So the idea here is, so theta, um, theta here says, let theta be an unknown parameter in a distribution of which we, it is hypothesized that it equals theta naught. So in other words, theta could be mu. Right? We don't know what mu is, but we hypothesize it's equal mu naught. That's what we just did. You can do the same thing with the variance if you want. Okay? The problem we cons were concerned with before was this particular case right here in our example, right? So we were concerned that the actual mean might be less than the value we assumed. So we had this acceptance region. So there, there's, the, there's the value that we hypothesize the mean is equal to. Okay. So you see, the, the idea behind this hypothesis test is, I think you can see pretty clearly from here. So here's what we hypothesized the mean to be. Let's say 200 microns. Let's say you calculated, you've, you took 10 samples and calculated the sample mean to be 199.2. Well, that's not equal to 200. <laughs> but it wouldn't be wise to not buy them because you're never going to satisfy that requirement, right? You take samples, average them together, they're actually 200. So this is why you need a test, okay? And what this test says is there's going to be some, obviously, if, if, if you're only concerned if it's less than, you don't care if it's greater than. So you'll accept anything. It doesn't matter if it's greater than, okay? But if it's less than, then there's this critical value at which you say that's enough. Um, that's too much less, and I'm not accepting it. That critical